Uh, thanks for joining us for another exciting episode of the Neo4j online meetup. <laughs> um, I am Corrine Wallach. I'm the community manager at Neo4j. And uh, this is Mark Needham. Mark is my Hello, colleague, everybody. developer relations engineer at Neo4j and co-author of the Graph Algorithms, the O'Reilly Graph Algorithms book. And if you haven't gotten it yet, you should. You can get it for free on our site. Um, so we are going to be, uh, we did this last week too, but this is the second week in a row that we're kind of doing this, where we're trying out a new software for the live stream on YouTube. It's called Crowdcast. Um, so the live chat, if you're watching the YouTube, you actually want to, if you want to participate in the live chat, you can log in through the Crowdcast link. Um, and you will find that link in the description of the YouTube. I've actually included a couple of links in the description of the YouTube video, um, just so you have access to things. Um, if you're watching live, you can ask questions in the chat room live. If you are watching much later and the live stream has ended, uh, there is a thread on the Neo4j community forum, the community site forum, uh, about this project where you can actually talk to the presenters directly and ask them questions. Um, so if you're not watching live, feel free to go there um, and ask them questions, or if you just wanna talk to them and ping them about their project anyway afterwards, if you're thinking about this three days from now and you're like, this project was really cool, I have more questions, you can do that. Um, also, uh, next week we have a another online meetup on using Neo4j and GraphQL to build human connection. Um, I think that's going to be an interesting one. And um, so please join us for that. Um, also, another pretty exciting thing is we just announced that we are going to be hosting a uh, Nodes 2019. And that is an acronym for Neo4j Online Developer Expo and Summit. Um, it was initially just Neo4j Online Developer Summit. Yeah. We tried to squeeze that E in there so we can make the nodes make sense. Um, and we did, so it's Nodes 2019. If you're watching in the YouTube link, uh, it's, it, it's in the description for Nodes 2019 is in the YouTube link. We'll also post it in the chat here. And the CFP is open. So if you're interested in submitting your talk and presenting, uh, feel free to do so. And is there anything else I'm missing, Mark, before we can get started? No, I think we're good. So I guess we can we can introduce our Thanks. our presenters. So we've got we've got two of you. So I guess maybe we we'll let you. Um, actually, both probably familiar faces if you've uh, if you've attended a, an online meetup before. So I guess maybe Mike, we can maybe you can. Oh, no, start with you. <laughs> <laughs> that part. Sure. Uh, yeah, I'm Mike Morley. I'm uh, uh, one of the founders of uh, uh, Minome Technologies, and we're based in Calgary, Canada. Um, and we're pretty excited about uh, speaking to you today about this the spatial and uh, applications of Neo4j to the world of geosciences. And we do a bunch of work in that domain. Um, so we're also really excited to be, you know, uh, co-presenting this with uh, Sony and Wei from Kinviz. Um, and they will tell you a little bit about their end of the spectrum. <laughs> yeah, hi, so I'm Sony Green. I'm the Director of Business Development at Kinviz. Uh, we are the developers of GraphXR. And we've been enjoying the crash course in uh, geological science that Mike has been giving us. And uh, yeah, excited to present as well. You guys have been getting a lot of buzz. So <laughs> like, I feel like I feel like I'm hearing about graphics are from everyone all over the place. And people are just fascinated with it. It's really cool if you have it. Well, now you have the opportunity to see it. <laughs> um, and then when you when you're ready to present, we'll also bring Wei on and Wei Sony's co partner, colleague, business partner, CEO, yeah. <laughs> CEO, everything. I'm like, I know you guys do everything together. <laughs> um, so uh, he's actually in the live stream chat. So if you have questions, you can also bug him there too. Um, okay, so Mike, we can ha hand it off to you. If you wanna share your screen, we can um, set this up. Okay, uh, share. Oh. It is giving me a message that says, the event is maxed out. Oh, okay. So that means we have to drop someone off. Sony, we might, we might drop you off for a minute. Oh, I can, do, I can, I can, I can. Well, you, we need you for questions. Well, I guess, yeah, that's true. We can do that. Does it let you do it now? Nope. Now it should let you. Give it a second. Still not. We're, this is our second time using Crowdcast, so we're apologizing in advance of the technical challenges. We didn't All right, know Ma Ma Michael McKenzie's late. He's just got here. 
I know. Everything's <laughs> fine. I saw that. <laughs> uh, still not having any luck. All um, right. So it is the, the share screen button, as it would suggest. Yeah, it says there are no more seats left in this event. It's already maxed out. Ask the host to open a seat. Oh, you know why? Because Sony, hold on. Sony didn't, okay, he didn't close his video. He, um, now it should work. He just ah. closed the video, but didn't close out of the window. We are now, yep, there we go. Okay. Okay. So here we go. So we'll share the entire screen. And let's. Oh, started. I see. It treats the, that as a fourth. Yeah, that's why I didn't set him as a presenter. Oh, got it. Cool. Can you see, All right, there Can you we see go. that okay now? <laughs> yep. Good? All right. All right, let's do it. So greetings. Thanks for everybody. And uh, thanks to Corinne and to Mark for setting this up. So this is actually, we're hoping this will be a little bit of a series. So today, the objective I have for today and we have for today is just to go through a little bit of a foundational thing in the world of geology and why we're very excited about the things that are going on with Neo4j and the disruptive nature that it really is going to bring the capabilities bring to the world of the geosciences and to the environmental data modeling. Uh, so I just want to introduce a few concepts today. Uh, I'm going to go through a couple of actual, these are these are real world use cases that I'm going to show you. Um, we've actually got a remediation project that is going on right now today. It's been running for several months um, that is using Neo4j as the, the backing store for uh, cleaning out contaminated soil from a site. Um, so I'll show you a little bit of that. Those data will obviously be anonymized, so we're not talking about you know client sensitive stuff. Uh, but then I'm going to turn it over to Sony and Wei to go through the actual three dimensional visualization part. So just a little bit of background here. So there has been a lot of innovation in the in the world of geosciences for many years. So this is, and I'm going to date myself a bit here, but you know do that as it may. Um, this was a session we did back in 1993 on using the amazingly powerful 40 megabyte hard drive with eight megabyte RAM uh, pen computer for doing field data collection um, at, at a mine up in Northern Ontario called the Craig Onaping mine. Um, and of course, anytime you get an innovation like this happening, you need a co-innovation around the data that you're actually now generating. So believe it or not, there was a time back in 1994, and this is an actual slide from a session that I was at in 1994, where we were debating the relative merits of using relational database technology for geological modeling. Um, so the, the parallels astound. You know, we are now having the same debate about graph databases in the world of geosciences, where it's like, what is this weird thing called a graph database? Why is it going to be better than what we're doing now? Um, but there was a time when relational databases were the new technology. Um, and when this was adopted, as we know the story, relational databases became the de facto standard for database storage and modeling mechanisms. Um, it was very, very successful and it allowed us to do all kinds of really powerful things. And this is another sort of historical thing where um, we were able to start doing three dimensional modeling of boreholes and whatnot, which enabled all sorts of other downstream innovations to come out of uh, the, this in terms of being able to really characterize complex, both underground surface and environmental uh, data. Um, this was extremely successful. Uh, and I was fortunate to get to see Alan Kay's uh, Turing Award lecture in 2004. And he, this is a, was an amazing presentation. It's actually online if you want to check it out. Um, he spoke a lot about innovation and, and the types of challenges he had in, in the world of bringing innovation uh, to fruition. One of the things that he said is, when you're successful with something, you tend to keep on doing what you're doing. And this certainly has been the case with relational database technology. Um, the way that geological data modeling has been done hasn't really changed very much since the 1990s. And this is in the light, even in the face of the massive increase of the volumes of data that we are now collecting. You know, there's the, the, the amount of data that is required to fully characterize a site is phenomenal uh, and it's growing all the time. Um, and what's happened is the modeling associated with this has become so complicated. And this is only a fraction. The schema that you see here is a fraction of an environmental data schema from a, a, one of the many systems that are out there that, that are common for modeling and managing environmental data. Um, it's become incredibly complicated to do this stuff. And as I love this quote by Ray Ozzy, complexity kills. And Alan Kay in that same lecture talked about, is this actually complicated or are we just making it complicated? And my belief after kind of landing into seeing Neo, Neo4j and the capabilities that are, that are there, it is extremely well suited uh, to modeling natural systems uh, in, from a, a data perspective. And that's because 
data for natural systems, it doesn't fit that well into a relational model when you start to scale it out. Um, the data are not hierarchical in nature. You don't get a nice kind of, oh, this thing goes into this thing, goes into this thing in the world of geology or environmental data. Um, you have many different types of data. You know, you have spatial data, you have complex three-dimensional structural data, you have time series data, you have unstructured data, text, documents, notes. Um, the data that we actually use to, uh, and I'll show you a little bit of this in terms of soil characterization, using what's known as the USCS uh, standard for soil characterization, is a text-based standard. Um, not to mention the fact we just have been, we did a proof of concept for a large Superfund site uh, that talks about that it, we're actually absorbing data from legacy and historical environmental impact assessment reports, most of which are giant PDFs. So we absorb all of those data and we can connect those in using the graph. We can actually hook all of that stuff up to get a single view of all the data. The other thing that's really important here is geoscientific data is very dynamic, it changes, new insight comes in all the time, um, and you really need to be able to have a full picture of the environment to be able to, to, to actually understand it properly. Um, so the question is, why are we still using 1980s technology? VisiCalc came out in 1979. We're still using spreadsheets. And it gets into this thing, Marshall McLuhan, this is another great quote, we shape our tools and then our tools shape us. And it's this notion of functional fixedness. Everybody I know that goes through geoscientific training, regardless of which domain they're in, they are taught how to use spreadsheets, they are taught how to use relational databases and those sorts of things. So data always becomes square. And as you know, you know, resistance is indeed futile. <laughs> when, you're, when you're shown something over and over again, that becomes the only thing that you can see. So really, we need to rethink data. Geoscience data is not square. It's very fluid. It is very graph in nature. Um, so we are really hoping to start uh, with this series and with getting out there, and especially now with things like GraphXR becoming in, into the forefront. Um, we're gonna be able to, I think, start to really move this forward and move into a whole new way of moving into data innovation. So the things that I see being exciting and powerful about Neo4j is it really gives you this ability to be uh, to get all of your data, spatial, time series, structured, unstructured, the whole works into one model. The model itself becomes a much simpler. So instead of having a complex schema that where you're trying to fit everything in there, you have a very nice fluid schema when you need it. If you need it to not have as much tight control over the schema, if you've picked up an observation that's out there that's a bit different, you can still bring that in. You can be very agile with it. And you can have the structure, the actual three-dimensional structures of the data itself in the same data set. Now, this is a very disruptive thing. And I'm gonna just talk about this really quickly because I know we don't have a lot of time today. But um, So we are working with this company, Pura. They're a startup here in, in Calgary. Um, and their objective is to make lives simple in the world of field and environmental data collection. So when they approached us about this whole thing, we said, yes, this is the graph database is the way to do this. And really it gets into this notion of agile field data collection, the enabling fast decision turnaround by having the data there and being able to model it and capture it very quickly, having all your field data in one place. Uh, something that's really important, I won't go through all these points, but kind of the key things are you don't have to have your full site characterized or set up. Most environmental systems force you to have a structure in place before you go out and you do your data collection. You don't have to with this. Site data collection is extensible on the fly. The structural aspects of the data are collected along with the metadata and with the lab results. And then, of course, something we've only just just barely touched on, um, and the reason that the, the, the book on graph algorithms is very exciting as well, um, all of the power of the graph algorithms become available when you model in this space. And of course, I've got a you know tremendous excitement about the idea of being able to model uh, pipeline routing and, and have all of the aspects of that and figuring out environmental receptors and doing probabilistic analysis associated with that, clustering analysis, which we're doing a little bit of right now, but could go a lot further with. Anyway, can't get into all that today, um, but we will in subsequent lectures, hopefully. Um, so this is the basic data model that we're using in behind the scenes uh, for this application. This is the application itself. It is a React front end. It is using GraphQL with Mutex to store the data. It is fully offline enabled. Uh, so it's a pretty cool little application that's been put together that we've our team has developed for Pura. It is being uh, field uh, tested in production. Um, the data that comes out of this, so this kind of gets into the real key bit here. And, and this, these are actual figures, again, anonymized, um, but these are actual data from the site where this work is going on. 
And the basic process goes like this. A field person will go out and there's an excavation going on where they're digging some contaminated material in, that's been spilled into the ground here. A field person will go out and they will actually sample the locations around the excavation that's being created. So the full extent of the excavation you see down here. And of course, as you'd expect, the excavation changes over time. Um, so what we do is as the points, these points here are being taken, these are samples, um, we tr track the data associated with those points, the locations where they are, those are stored as nodes in the graph. We hook all of those things up and we use a computational ge uh, geometry algorithm, uh, uh, con, we always get these two mixed up, it's like stalactites and stalagmites. <laughs> uh, convex polygons, so polygons that can fold in on themselves. There's algorithms for that that you can use to apply to, to actually create a proper geometrical out, uh, ge uh, geometry outline of a polygon from points. So we use that to generate these outlines. These outlines actually delimit three-dimensional steps down into the ground as the pit advances. And what ends up happening is we need to capture all of the decisions that were made into extending those, those boundaries, because that's a critical thing in terms of being able to know and make decisions about how you advance the pit and which direction you advance the pit and why you advance that pit when you did. Um, so these are all really important things to track. Um, and I'm just gonna jump into the Neo4j browser for a second. Uh, so we can have a look at this. So the data actually looks like this when it comes back. Hopefully. Hey Mike, maybe zoom it in. Oh, bit. sure. One second, I will zoom it up. Can you see that? Yeah, I don't think you can zoom that bit anyway, but I think probably all right. Uh, is that okay? Uh, I, the more, yeah. the main thing to take in is the shape of it. So this is the actual site model. So that diagram that I was showing you just on the slides back there, this is the data model that lives in behind it. And of course, you know, while I, I dearly love the, the Neuro4j browser, um, the downside, as you can see with this from a, from a geoscientist perspective, is that it doesn't actually show me um, the structure of the data as it is in the field. So this has limited utility with respect to being able to understand and characterize and visualize the site. So while I can use this to kind of generate queries and do other types of analyses with the data itself, I cannot use this to actually from a geoscientist perspective, characterize the site and whatnot. So this is where it, the, the kind of Before you move off that, can you just give like a quick, like what are the, what are the colors of the different things? Just oh, so everybody's got- Certainly, sorry. Crash course in the model, so- Yeah, yeah. So what we've got is we've got, um, you've got the central node here, which is the actual site itself. And this is also connected to adjacent metadata that I'm not showing in terms of where the site is, who drilled it, who the client is, the project and all that kind of stuff. Um, then what ends up happening is you'll have many different locations potentially on that site. So each one of these is a different remediation location. Um, each one of those locations can then have one or many polygons associated with it, where and these actually represent the different stages of the excavation, these green guys. So this could be day one when they started digging, and this is day two, and then day three. Uh, so as the pit starts to evolve, we capture, and then these guys that you see here are the actual polygonal boundaries um, associated with the, the pits themselves. And you can see they vary in size. So some pits, they, they may start off with just a few points and then they can get to be, there are other ones in, in the data set here that are quite large in terms of the number, the ultimate number of points that are around them. Um, and then connected to these things that I'm also not showing in this particular one, but I'll show you in a minute, um, are all of the actual sample data that's being collected that goes into then making these uh, figures. Uh, so what I'll do is pop this back up. How are we doing? Uh, so as I mentioned, so samples are taken at those different locations. These are sent out to the lab. The samples come back and they're, they're analyzed. These red guys, red is bad, of course. These are exceedances. So these are areas where they need to take more action. Um, these results are integrated into the data model directly. And then we can do uh, calcs on that to say, okay, in spots where we've got uh, potential exceedances going on, what are the actual exceedances which are shown on the map on the right-hand side here? Uh, these are non-compliant locations and it actually shows you the EC, so the, the level of contamination. And these are um, uh, the amount of uh, vapor that's coming off of this, so the amount of contamination that's actually present in the soil. So then what they'll do is they'll make decisions about, okay, now we got to keep digging this way until you end up getting green. 
So you dig until you don't have contaminants and then you stop. And the key with all of this is the faster you can make that decision, the better off you are. Um, and that's because you want to minimize the amount of disturbance while maximizing the amount of uh, remediation that you're able to accomplish, um, which is kind of denoted here. So, um, oops. This little model here shows, uh, shows flare pits. Um, and again, same sort of thing. You can't really get a sense of um, what this looks like inside the Neo4j browser. Uh, but if we fire up our friend GraphXR here, and just to start the, the transition over to our colleagues, if I fire this query in here, I run it. So you'll see you get this little kind of weird little blobby guy like you would in, in, the, in the graph itself. Um, just zoom this up a bit. Now we get to fly in space here all the way down to, oh, and there we go. That's the actual, um, I'll zoom this up some. Let's actually just make one little tweak here. Project, uh, these are site nodes. I think we want to get rid of those. Nope. And project nodes. Yeah, close enough. Um, so if you ignore these little dots in the middle, there is a way to shut them off. But in the interest of time, I'll just talk to this. So the pink outlines here that you see, these are the pit boundaries. And you can see the pit evolution as you go along. So square one, square two, they kind of dug. It's like, okay, no contamination over here, but there must have been some over there. So then they continue to excavate this out. Um, and I'm going to save the, this isn't a great representation of what GraphXR is capable of, but it gives you at least a basic idea that, hey, if you actually plot these things the way they are, instead of using the, the, the standard uh, dots and lines approach, I can then start to see how things are evolving in a spatial sense. And uh, like, uh, Sony and, and Wei will take you through a, a much better example of this in a second here. Um, but I got to frame it up first. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to look at something um, the other part of site characterization gets into this idea of boreholes. Um, and what a borehole is, is it's a hole that we drill in the ground in the geosciences to delimit the things that are subsurface. And this is really important, and there's all sorts of different types of boreholes that are used out there. Uh, I'm just going to talk about one today, which is what we call a lithology borehole. And that is for characterizing soil. So this would and is being used on that site that I was showing you uh, to delimit contaminated soil and the types of soils that are uh, subsurface. And it's important to, to do this because you can identify areas where uh, if there's uh, fractures in the ground, like you see here, if the soil is more fractured, like this stuff is, contaminants will flow faster through that. This looks to be some kind of a silt clay that acts as a barrier to contaminant transportation. So you need to go through as a geologist and understand really what's happening subsurface. You build a model out of that by drilling a bunch of holes. You characterize the soil using this sort of crazy decision tree that you can't quite read there. And that gives you basically this little uh, log. Um, and what this is, is this is, as you go down the hole, each one of these guys would be a layer. So clean gravel, gravel with fines, clean sand, sands with fines, uh, and then inorganic clay, low to medium plasticity. So basically what this tells me, organic clays of high to medium plasticity and, and peat other organic soils. So looking at this as a geologist, what I would expect is these sand layers would be, uh, allow contaminants to be transported fairly easily versus these other guys, these more clay, more dense materials would be a barrier to contaminant transportation. So really key stuff to know when you're when you're actually delimiting a site. And again, cool thing with this and the disruptive thing with Neo4j is we can get all of our surface characterization, so all the site data, everything else associated with that. Uh, we can get the basic borehole data pulled in as it's being uh, extracted from the ground and logged. And then we could transform this and represent it actually as a linked list of data exactly like a borehole would be. So you start off with the collar and you go down each interval down the hole where you see each one of those layers. And that is a geologist making a note about the type of material that's at, at that step. Um, and the really amazing thing for me looking at this is like these things look like the boreholes actually are. We're in a relational database, looks like a bunch of weirdly linked tables and it can be very difficult to tell what the heck's going on. Um, data equals structure in the world of the graph. And like I say, this is, a, I think, a very powerful thing. Uh, this is a shot of a graph XR plot of the boreholes that we're going to show you here in a second in, in actual 3D, um, where they are on the surface. Um, and I'll just show you really quickly here the, uh, 
the boreholes themselves, hopefully in the Neo 4J thing itself. Let me just pull this up. Oh, I think I lost my browser. Ah, well, oh, there it is. So what I'm doing here is I'm pulling back the uh, geological model that's in behind uh, the borehole model. And again, same sort of thing. While the physics engine in here gives me a basic representation of the fact that these are in fact linked lists and I'll uh, uh, just to describe what these things are. So the, the top orange guy there is what we call a collar. So that's the spot where we started drilling on the surface. And then what you have is you have next interval down to the, the first sample that was taken which in this case is clay. And that's, um, and that, that'll be a certain distance down the hole. Um, and then this will be another interval down the hole. So this one's uh, nine feet down the hole from this top point. Um, so basically what you've got then is you've got a whole bunch of these little uh, link lists here. And I think my sense is, and I haven't done this yet, but again, it's gonna be, we're gonna continue to iterate and evolve as we go with this. Um, the basic step from this point forward, like the next step I would do as a geologist is I'd start to go, okay, well, borehole 118 and 116, uh, I look for similar materials in there. So till to till, there's a big gap, sand, and then there's shale. So likely what happened here is I've got a big block of till here, and then these two shales are likely linked as well. And then there's a sand interval in the middle on this one that pinches out somewhere in between these two boreholes. Um, so I would do an interpretation between those to link up the like nodes and and draw basically lines between them to get a, 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 a geological cross section. And then I would use that geological cross section to develop a 3D model out of it to actually model the subsurface material. My sense is, is that we could actually start using graph and computational uh, ge geometry methods to begin to actually do some of that interpretive work inside of uh, the graph environment. Um, of course, as you see in here again, the physics engine does not give us, that's here does not give us an actual representation of what this would look like. So that's where um, GraphXR comes into the picture. Um, so at this point, I would like to hand it over to uh, my colleagues at Kinevis um, to talk about the work that they are, uh, that they are doing in, the, in uh, GraphXR. I am going to add them in a moment. I'm gonna add Sony first and then Thank you, Mike. And while we're doing that, I guess if anybody has any questions um, about the first part, now's your <laughs> now's your chance to get them in before we kick Mike off. Yeah. yeah. Although you're still staying online, right? I'm so still staying good. online. Yeah. So do I, I have to turn something off here? Turn off my camera? Uh, I'll, I could shut it off for you, and then I can. Okay. Leave. Perfect. Okay. Well, do you do you do have a question, Mike? Before you before you go. Um, can you can you explain in a bit more detail how you're using the grand stack of the GraphQL part of the? the stuff oh there? yeah, so the the little application they showed you, Pure, as, as they call it, the sample management system and the the logging tool that we've developed uh, in conjunction with them, that is using the grand stack. So um, it has it, there's two parts to it. We use uh, one bit to actually run the UX piece. So there's the piece that's running in behind that to capture the actual data as it's being collected and whatnot. Uh, the other piece, actually, right now, we are using the grand stack as well to get the data out uh, to so the things that we're using to generate the maps, which are um, a combination of Esri and sort of more traditional, uh, you know, G GIS tools. We're actually using the grand stack there, so that people, the, our colleagues, who are doing that work, it is offline. Um, the the uh, the actual data collection system has to be offline. Many places that we work do not have connections to the internet. Um, the interpretive part, though, we are using the grand stack to get the data out of that and into the table generation and the figure generation bits as well. And it, it works really nicely because the people that we're working with, um, in some cases, don't have deep knowledge of uh, Cypher and whatnot. So that gives us a bit of an abstraction layer uh, that lets them kind of work with the, the GraphQL aspect, which is a little simpler. Thank you. Um, so other thing, too, just for like the people in the chat rooms and everything, um, there's an interesting feature on Crowdcast that we can use where if you ask a question, you can actually label it as a question with either the little plus sign, you can do like as a question, and then it pops up as a question. And then we could start recording the answer. And then answers after the fact can be filtered out by the question. So like people can click on the question and just see the answer for that specific question. So 
we can try that for future questions too. So, and then if we if we need to bring Mike back or whatever, we can do that also. You know, it's a good time for us to play around with the software and see if we like it. Um, okay, Mike. So we'll see you shortly. I'm going to bring Wei on. Thank you. All right. Okay, we are going to invite Wei. Oh, you know what I just realized, Mark? <laughs> we're not going to be able to share a screen with <laughs> with both of us, so we're going to have to knock one of them off. Yeah, you can close, close me for now, and I'll, I'll come back later on. OK. Hi. Hi, guys. Hi. Hey. Hi. 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 <laughs> um, so Wei and Sony, I mean, if, if, like as Mark said before, if you guys already watch the online meetups, then you yeah. might be familiar with them. So I'm going to let you guys take it away. Um, Sony, are you the one sharing mm -hmm. What's that? You're the one sharing your screen? Uh, yes, yes, I will be. Awesome. So, uh, Wei, did you want to introduce yourself real quick? Hi, uh, this is Wei. I'm founder and CEO of Kinaviz and been doing it. Th thanks so much for this food is that? It's like there's no audience here except for the people in the chat room. <laughs> My iPad. Sorry about that. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. oh, sorry. So much. Uh, you're, uh, no problem. Thanks so much. Uh, and, uh, here, okay. uh, and Mike, and it's a the mic stuff is it's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, Sony, what, uh, what did you uh, take take it from here? Sure. Okay. Um, so let's see. I will jump into the screen share here. Uh, Um, and anyone in the chat rooms, if you guys have questions, put the little plus sign. Do ask a question, and, uh, and when you're doing the chat, and then we can answer it and actually record the answer. So, uh, so I am now in GraphXR here. Some you may be familiar with. I'll just pick up right where uh, Mike left off, basically, and load up that same sample set. Uh, so, run for my Cypher query window here, and you'll you'll notice it's essentially the uh, the same structure. You know these collars, and then the intervals below them. Let me crank up the edge thickness there. Um, and if I go to the the map view. You'll see that that same grid we were looking at before. So I'm actually going to uh, hide my map now and show you guys. Uh, and, and that map, by the way, that's uh, courtesy of Mapbox. Uh, this this next feature I'm going to show you is uh, a beta that we're we're working on with Mike. Uh, it's one of the nice things about graphics are it's highly extensible, so I'm able to. Uh, create this um, terrain window. And I'll, based on the, uh, the position of the nodes here in my graph, I can say, draw terrain. And just take a second here. And so now this is a, a satellite view of that same uh, area. Next, within my, uh, and this is actually 3D, it's kind of hard to tell because it's apparently a very flat area. But uh, when I, now back here in the terrain view, I'll set my nodes to the terrain and Now you can see this is a, a representation of the, the actual boreholes. Um, so I want to get the place there, but um, I can click on any one of these and pull up info and see you know, the, the full set of notes on it. Now, 
this view is, is a little hard to uh, make out much. So instead, I'm going to look at the properties. I'm going to look at what the different layers represent. Um, make my nodes a little bigger here. And so now you can already start to see if I wanted to just look at uh, you know, a, a till node, for example, you do that. Um, what I can also do is actually, because part of what's interesting is not so much the, uh, the individual samples, but it's the areas defined by the samples. So I'm going to go to uh, update controls. There we go. Ah, ah there we go. <laughs> um, so now you're seeing the the actual composition, and you know we can see a lot of till here. Uh, if I wanted to look at something, say where my uh, my sand intervals are, I can uh, just hone in on those the, the red areas here, and so this allows me to you know, to quickly identify areas of interest for a particular. Uh, activity, remediation, whatever, or I, I should say, allow someone like Mike to quickly identify it since I don't really know too much about the uh, terrain. Um, so, so I also, in addition to to looking at uh, you know this, how this applies to to geological science, I just wanted to show uh, another example of how three uh, D terrain can be. Uh, visualized in graphics are so. I, I I do actually have some questions for you, Sony. Oh, okay, uh, sure. If you want to answer them, so uh, and if you are getting to it later, then you could just skip over it for now. But um, okay. somebody, if uh, Michael McKenzie asked if graphics are works in an offline environment. <clears throat> uh, yes. If you if you're using uh, Neo Four J desktop, you can run it as a graph app and uh, run it directly uh, you'll still you'll still use the um, the the graph app pulls the the application online but the the data source can be offline okay uh then we also have what else is here how deep is one of the deeper holes there um you can aggregate length of till. Yeah, I think that, I think that the how deep is one of the deeper holes there. That's probably a, a Michael. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, Mike Morley, you're in the chat. Please respond. <laughs> okay, continue. I'm sorry for interrupting. Uh, so, so this, you know, just because um, Everest has been in the news a lot, I uh, I just did a, a search here for. Uh, a tour of Mount Everest in the Google Earth KMZ format. And I'm just going to save this to my desktop here. And I'm just going to clear this data. And now pull in this KMZ. And you'll see it, it appears immediately as nodes. And again, I can use the, the map view to, to see it just from a, a normal map perspective. Now, when I pull up my uh, terrain window again, Now you can see a little more clearly uh, that this is actual 3D terrain. Um, uh, 
and you can see the uh, the actual path here of this uh, it's a, a tour um, well I guess that's what's called in uh, Google Earth at least I'm just going to, to get rid of the uh, individual points here so I can focus on uh, these are the points that have uh, some notes associated with them so I can pull up the uh, <laughs> terrifyingly named death zone here um, and you know as I said because Everest has been in the news a lot and I just got this link about uh, high altitude drone capture so if I want to make a note of that I can you know just copy the, uh, the URL there in this particular case so I could say uh, article and then paste the note in because I'm uh, I don't actually have admin privileges on this particular data set I won't be able to write it directly to that node but what I can do instead is um, create a uh, remark node so invitation and then uh, you know the because this is still all all beta uh, you know some things need to be worked out with the positioning of that we can see that there's a link between this new remark node and I can just click it to pull up the link from that URL so you know there there's a lot of ways that you can annotate the data uh, once it's in RAPXR. So, so um, more questions? Uh, not right now. There's people asking, but there's a activity there between Mike Morley and some of the other users. I just okay. realized too that people can also vote on questions. So if someone asks a question and tags it as a question, other people can vote if they want that. <laughs> so that's a that's a good thing too. But yeah, you can continue. Uh, so that, that's that's pretty much it for today. Um, and oh. <laughs> I will definitely refer any questions about uh, lithology to to Mike. All right, let me. Uh, I'm going to bring and, in. Uh, uh, I, I will just say. Um, you know, as I mentioned, this is beta functionality, but if anyone is interested in testing it out, uh, please just drop me an email and uh, we, can, we can set that up for you. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, hold on, I'm bringing in Mark on, uh, Mark Needham back. Hey, so anyway, I guess we, what, what, uh, what email should we share with people to get in contact with you about that? Oh yeah, I guess that would be handy. Uh, yeah. I guess you can you can just there we go. There we go. Cool. My, so, so, so yeah, at .com if you if you'd like to play around with that beta functionality. Yeah. Yeah, Mike. Cool. Mike uh, more than looks like he's getting some pretty deep in explanations and stuff. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if maybe we should just bring him back on. To, sure. Um. Yeah. I'm, oh. Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna drop <laughs> my. Uh, Everybody's closing. Everybody's the window. Gonna kick him off. <laughs> Wait, no, I'm just. I'm gonna close off way. I'm gonna close off way, and I'm gonna. Sony's still here. I'm gonna add Mike, and he can add his comments in in, in non-human kind of human form. <laughs> this is. We're getting the hang of it slowly. We'll get there little by baby steps. It's actually not that hard to use this software. I kind of. I like Crowdcast. It's pretty intuitive. Here he is. He's back. I like this Brady Bunch review. Uh, so what, yeah, I guess maybe an interesting thing. What, what's like your? Is there some more stuff you're doing on with this data set or with the exploration? Like, what's your what, what's your next uh, next exciting thing to to explore? Uh, Mike, you're muted. Oh, there we go. There we go. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. <laughs> Um, no, it's been a tremendous amount of fun for me because I mean, this is stuff that I've been you know working in this domain for quite a while. So, and seeing something like this come along, it's like, wow, you know, there's a whole new way of looking at the world, right? So um, 
I started up, uh, the first one I did was uh, spatial experiments. So I've got this series called the Neo4j uh, spatial experiments. Um, the first one I did was actually uh, taking the concept of a walk score. Um, so it's, um, and that's up on that link that I posted up there, uh, Neo4j or spatial experiments in the, in the chat there. Um, and basically what I wanna try and do is go through a couple of different experiments using uh, spatial and graph applications to kind of try some of these concepts out and sort of see how far we can push this thing. Um, and that's kind of when uh, when you did the presentation, Sony uh, and Way on uh, graphics. Sorry, the piece that I was missing was the visualization aspect. So I was like, oh, this is the this is awesome. This kind of solves the last mile problem around getting the you know being able to see this stuff. Uh, so the first experiment I did was a computing walk score and just to see if I could use straight up graph methods to figure out. Uh, spatial distances with respect to replicating the walk score itself. Um, that was just using the standard algorithm. So that's the walk score is just an algorithm that lets you figure out how uh, walkable your neighborhood is. It's pretty widely used in, uh, in the architectural engineering construction city planning side of the geosciences. Um, so got that one working. And then I started working on the, um, uh, the borehole one. And then the next one after that I want to try and do is, is closing the loop on the walk score by taking the spatial experiment that uh, Craig Traverner and uh, Will did back at uh, Graph Connect, where they took the, that, the, you know, computing the routing distances, but factoring routing distances. So replacing the, uh, the walk score algorithm itself just uses a straight line distance to compute uh, distance to amenities to factor the score out which isn't a very great way of doing it because you're not factoring in, you know, distant, actual distances. You're not uh, determining whether there's a lake in the way of somebody going from the amenity to their house or anything like that. So conceptually, if I use uh, um, shortest distance or Dijkstra's or A-star to actually compute the real distance and put that into the algorithm and then bring in all the amenity scores on top of that. So again, getting into spatial plus graph plus adjacent data, having all of the data and just instead of just some of the data, I'm more likely to walk to, you know, a cafe that I really like where there's a musician that I like playing than I am to go to the Starbucks on the corner. So I think there's a nice way of improving the walk score rank by using graph methods. Uh, same thing on the geology side, you know, so I want to get into um, much deeper into this in terms of trying to experiment with uh, interpretive aspects of, of geology and whatnot. Um, and then there's a lot of things we should be able to do in terms of uh, clustering algorithms and whatnot, looking for chemical patterns and things. Like I said, we had earlier on, we have a project going on uh, that we did a proof of concept for on a Superfund site, which is in, uh, in um, New Jersey, actually, um, where it's a whole pile of PDF files. So we've got an engine that we put together that chugs through all the PDF files. It's kind of like a, a PDF data Pachenko machine. Um, and it kind of goes through, tries to open the PDF files up, pulls the data out of them, hooks them all up in the graph, does some NLP stuff to figure out if they've got chemistry in them and whatnot. And then what we do is we decompose the tabular data down and then recompose it up into a single, uh, that's our goal is to get it into a single geological data set that then we can do geoscientific analysis on it doing fingerprints and whatnot of contaminant came from such and such a location. Um, so it's this kind of thing, you know, being able to have an engine capable of handling text capable of handling geological representations, the structural aspect of the data in one place is a really powerful thing. And then being able to visualize all this stuff using GraphXR is pretty awesome. Wow. <laughs> <clears throat> um, we do have some questions, some other questions um, lined up. This is, this is really very cool. Thank you guys very much for taking the time to share this. Um, somebody asked, uh, are you planning on moving from visualization to modeling? interactive picking of geology, building 3D volumes, for example. <laughs> so uh, I, I guess I'm, I'm understanding that to be like the, the 3D, well, Mike, what would be the, the term for that? The, like, so that gets more into actual interpretation of the geological structures. So um, part of the process associated with geological interpretation. So you actually did a bunch of it there where you turned the boreholes into actual traces. Um, the next step with that is to actually then start linking up. So interpreting saying, okay, this chunk of the borehole links to this guy over here. So these two intervals then become mesh that exist in between them. And then you construct volumes out of those things. Um, right. Yeah, volumes, that was the, <laughs> and, and so 
that that is something that could conceivably be done in graphics are as well. Okay. Yeah, uh, and the neat thing about that is I'm thinking about this a bit. You know, block modeling is a t is an is a thing that's typically used in Krieging and whatnot to kind of generate volumes. There are a number of systems out there that do this sort of thing uh, already, but um, again. If you're using because of the fractal nature of the graph, um, my sense is is that you could actually get a much more granular model without the computational load that you'd have using sort of standard methods for this. Um, you know, again, I haven't tried had the opportunity to try this out yet, uh, but you know, you could get into modeling ore bodies likely in a much more accurate way than you can using sort of approximate volumes. Um, anyway, these again, these are all things that. Uh, Hopefully, we'll get a chance to try at some point. <laughs> That's really cool. Uh, if anybody has any other questions, feel free to ask now while you have the, the guys presenters live. Um, <laughs> I do have another question too. Another question from Michael McKenzie, following up about his previous question about this application. Uh, what about offline via server? Uh, so for our for our enterprise clients, yes, that that's not something available in our uh, free version. But uh, but yes, that is also available. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Do we have any other questions right now? If not, you can go to the community site and ask them all the questions you want there. They are Way Sony and Mike Morley are all on the community site. I did just want to say hi to Andrew Dessies uh, from yeah. Noranda Technology Center. I worked with him. So some of those examples I was showing you uh, early on from back in the day, we actually worked together for a number of years up uh, at the Noranda Research Center in Montreal. So it's great to see you. <laughs> he said yes, sorry, man. <laughs> so I got my hat on, you know. It's a <laughs> the summer tube. You've always got your hat on. Well, oh, that's true. It's that's Canadian, true. Right? <laughs> Whatever month we do a meetup with Mike, the hat remains. <laughs> it's like, what are you hiding under there? Oh, it's, it's um. You yeah, got a it's... massive afro. <laughs> <laughs> mm, no, sadly. <laughs> Two corners. Two the shiny domes. <laughs> shiny domes. That's right. Yeah, one day I'll take it off at a party and everybody will be astonished. You know, it's, a, it's like a big snake tattoo up there or something. <laughs> oh, oh big graph. Yeah, graph. There yeah, we go. That's what I should get as a tattoo. Well, there was a woman I, that I ran into at one of the conferences that had a cipher query on the back of her. No way. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Whoa. Italian girl. That's awesome. She lives in Italy. Huh. Uh, so people are saying thank you, Elaine Rosenberg, who does like the, our online training. Uh, she said, thank you, Mike and Sony. Very interesting. Uh, Leonard Armstrong said, it's a tuck, isn't it? Tuk. Tuk. T-O-Q-U-E. Come on. Canadian. Get Canadian. Yeah, you got to watch Letter Kenny. That'll explain. Get Canadian. How do you want me to get Canadian? I'm not Canadian. Yeah, you got you to watch Letter Kenny, although be warned, it's not uh, safe for work, that show. But it, it does talk about all the expressions that are used in Canada, such as pitter patter. <laughs> Um, Andrew said, Mike, you continue to think ahead of the curve. And <laughs> Emmanuel said, thanks, interesting work. And Sean Cockrell, who works with neo for j um, in Texas, he said, let's party, show the snake. Oh, jeez. <laughs> hey, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, cool. So uh, thank you, guys. Um, Mike, Mark, is there anything else? Oh, if, you, if you're watching the YouTube video after the fact, Please give this a thumbs up if you like the presentation, or even if you liked it so much that you're watching it on Crowdcast and you feel the urge to go to YouTube <laughs> and tell them how much you loved it. Those um, thumbs up things Mark, really uh, help other people find the video. Um, there, Mark is on it. He shared the YouTube link right there. Yeah, just one thing I realized I always forget to share the link to actually sign up for graphics are there. Yeah, that's oh. kind of a good thing. <laughs> Yeah. And, a uh, it's a lot of fun to play with. Yeah, so I feel you know, like I should really get in the habit of, of sharing that with people, maybe. But uh, yeah, thank you guys so much for having us. And Mike, thank you for uh, taking us on this voyage under the earth. Yeah, no worries. Thanks for all the great work you're doing, uh, all of you. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Thanks, yeah. guys. And uh, we'll see you all next week. You got it. Yeah. Cheers. Right.